So welcome everybody um, to the 10th edition of the Cannabis Thinking Talks. My name is Alex Lucena and I'm an associate partner and head of innovation for the Green Hub. And um, this is a very special edition of this talk. But before I introduce our guests, uh, I will, it's a pleasure for me to have, for us, for the Green Hub, to have for the first time Patricia Vilela Marino um, with us tonight. She's a co-founder and president for Humanitas 360 Institute, 360 Institute, that works, works in several countries in the Americas to reduce violence and improve the quality of the population in general. So Patricia, hopefully this is the first of many, many talks that we have you with us. Thank you so much being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, and of course, uh, my, my partner, associate partner, Marcelo Greco from the Green Hub, and that when it comes to the cannabis industry is certainly one of the top specialists in our country. So we have three Brazilians and two Colombians. Oh, this, is, this is a very Latin America, a Latin American um, conversation, although we're doing it in English and uh, we'll be providing subtitles in Portuguese and Spanish. So nobody, I guess we'll, we'll be able to speak with about 70 to 80 percent of the of the entire world population with these three languages, give or take. So with no further ado, I would like uh, to introduce uh, two Colombians, as I said, and um, and uh, here. So first of all, my friend Juan Pablo Escobar, he's an architect and founder of books and an entrepreneur as good as it gets. So Pablo is uh, in Mexico today where he has an uh, ongoing business. He lives in Argentina and he's a very close friend of, uh, of the Green uh, Pablo. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. a pleasure to be here with you. An honor. Thank you. And Juan Manuel Galan, former senator from Colombia, and a very in, a person that had a very important participation shaping up the legislation, the cannabis legislation in Colombia, among many other things. Also an entrepreneur, a, uh, a consultant for, for, for governments from all over the world. So Galan, as well, fantastic having you with us, with this conversation with the, uh, the three Brazilians and, and of course, um, Pablo. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Alex, for the invitation. Uh, hello to Patricia and to Sebastian. Hello, Juan Manuel. So, <laughs> so tonight we'll be talking about many topics here, uh, next hour or so, including the evolution of the cannabis market, prohibition, legislation, the so-called war against drugs, okay, uh, I prefer the word peace. It's it's a Pablo's uh, statement. It's not the war, but the peace that we're trying to. The word peace involved in this conversation very heavily. Public policies, health, in the use of cannabis, and something that is very very important, which is peacemaking among people, which is so important in the world that we're living in, at this point. So I would like to start with you, Pablo, pass the ball to you, as we say in soccer and football, uh, for your initial remarks. So if you could, you know, in the next five minutes or so, introduce yourself for those who don't know you and um, tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, you and, um, and Gala got to meet each other. What, what is the story telling that we, we, we love to hear from you too? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, well, um, my name is Juan Pablo Escobar. I am the son of Pablo Escobar. I legally changed my name uh, once my father passed away. And I decided to move from Colombia to stay away from violence, uh, the violence that somehow I inherited from my father and the hate and everything that was after us and after my family. So we needed to escape from violence, we went to exile and we have been living for the past 
26 years of our lives in Argentina. And my father was perhaps uh, recognized, sadly, as one of the most dangerous and wealthiest uh, drug dealers in the world. He built the, the Medellin cartel. And sadly, he took one of the worst decisions in his life. And he ordered the killing of Juan Manuel's father, Mr. Luis Carlos Galán. He was a presidential candidate that was for sure going to be our next president. But uh, the drug, uh, you know, the war on drugs uh, brought a lot of uh, violence to the country. And my father was highly responsible for that. And, um, and this is how I get to know Juan Manuel, because uh, I wrote a, a letter for him and for his brothers and, and family, because I was asking for forgiveness, you know, in, in terms of the damage that my father caused to their families. And because I truly believe that peace and reconciliation is, is not a theory, it's something that we can truly, you know, um, overcome and move forward and have for ourselves in our society. So... Thanks to the generosity of Manuel and his brothers, uh, I had the opportunity to meet him in person in Colombia in the year 2008, in October. Um, once uh, we could have the opportunity of meeting each other for a documentary called uh, Sins of My Father. So since then, you know, I have the honor and the privilege to know Juan Manuel. And, and also, uh, it was very hard for me to speak with him and with his brothers about the violence they suffer uh, thanks to my father's actions. So this is mostly what I'm, uh, how I know Juan Manuel and how I'm preparing to move forward in life in terms of forgiveness and, and reconciliation. So that will be the, the story, the short story. I'm sorry, Alex, is, uh, your, your microphone is mute. I apologize. No, and of course, just to, co to compliment saying that uh, you, you, you're an architect and an author of, of books that are currently uh, out there. So just uh, two lines about what you like to Thanks write for, about. <laughs> Thanks for helping me out with the books and the, 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 cur the curriculum that I have. Well, yes, I forgot that part, you know, because uh, for me, it's like what I did in life is not important. Uh, you know, I'm what I'm just trying to do is uh, seeking forgiveness and trying to find a way so the world could, uh, you know, have the opportunity to declare peace on drugs and to have a wiser way to understand and to handle this problem that can affect us all, you know, without any discrimination. So this is mostly my, my story. Perfect. Gala, would you like to step in, please? Yes, mm, thank you for the opportunity. And well, my, my father, Luis Carlos Galán, was a former presidential candidate, as Sebastián mentioned it. He was very close to uh, gaining uh, the presidency of Colombia in the year 1990. And uh, when he was, uh, when he started very early in life, his political career. He was appointed Minister of Education when he was just 26 years old. Then he was at 28 appointed as ambassador from Colombia to Italy. And we spent, I spent the three and a half first years of my life in Italy. And my brother was born in Italy. That's why uh, my father picked the name Claudio because he wanted to honor uh, <laughs> Italy. Uh, through my, my brother's name. And um, when he was ambassador, he saw the danger and the threat that the mafia, Italian mafia, um, established uh, against the political establishment, trying to penetrate the political establishment, and also many other sectors of society. And that experience that my father uh, lived in Italy uh, was the... the, the the thing that made him see clearly in Colombia when these uh, mafias started to grow exponentially because of marijuana, because of emeralds, because of cocaine in the 1980s, he saw beforehand in Italy the damage that the mafia could cause. 
And that's why he started to speak up about the dangers for the Colombian democracy, the Colombian society of allowing such a criminal uh, project to prosper and to threaten the society as a whole because uh, narco-traffic not only threatens uh, through violence, crime, but through corruption. Because I, I, I sustain that in Colombian narco-traffic, it's not only being being a criminal project, but a political project, trying to dominate a territory, populations, trying to buy elections to co-opt the political uh, power uh, at the local level, at the regional level, and at the national level. We have had um, uh, presidential campaigns financed by uh, illicit drug money. We have had uh, congressmen elected with the support of the drug dealers. And at every level of the administration and the government, um, drug money uh, through the uh, criminal organizations have tried to penetrate the state and the political uh, power. So my father speak up against these threats and these real dangers. And uh, for that, uh, and the war on drugs, he was, he was assassinated. Uh, he was assassinated the 18th of August mm. of 1989 in Swacha. It's a very small town uh, right near Bogota, the capital. And uh, well, many, many people said when he was assassinated that uh, hope was assassinated for the Colombian people. Uh, a whole generation of Colombians had hope that Luis Carlos Galán will open the gates of a new society, a uh, more just society in terms of income, in terms of disparities between rural population and urban population, a country that empowers uh, local, local authorities to have real uh, power in terms of budget, in terms of decisions to apply and, and benefit their people. So all this country, uh, many, many people think a whole generation of Colombia uh, was assassinated with Luis Carlos Galán. So the peace process now that we are trying to save, it's a new hope for uh, those ideas, those ideals that uh, my father stood for. And I decided to get got involved in politics because of my father's assassination. If my father uh, could, uh, could live on and be president of Colombia, I would never got involved in politics. I got involved in politics because I thought when I learned the sad news, the painful news that our father was killed, that all those years of efforts, of sacrifices, of time consumed, uh, uh, going out in the whole country, speaking out, risking his life all the time uh, was worth of continuing fighting for his cause. That's why uh, my brother and I got involved in politics, thinking about his ideals, his ideas, and not seeing his ideals killed with him. But not only Pablo Escobar was behind my father's assassination. Uh, the Cali cartel uh, was also behind my father's assassination the paramilitaries that were financed by narco-traffic with the complicity of many members from the security apparatus from the state, the army, the police force, the DAS, which, is, which was the official office of intelligence in Colombia, among with corrupt politicians, among with members of the, this uh, security complex of the state, uh, the general, uh, Massa Marquez was condemned because he was found guilty of being one of the murderers of my father, uh, the head of the intelligence in Colombia, um, and also a famous politician who was Minister of Justice uh, in Colombia, who was working with both drug cartels during the 1980s, Alberto Santofimio Botero, who worked for the Cali cartel, and at the same time worked as an advisor, as political advisor for the Medellin cartel. So it was a whole complot, 
a whole conspiracy behind my father's assassination. And I think the intent was to assassinate the hope of change in Colombia, not only to kill an enemy of the narco traffickers who was uh, who stood for extradition as a way to uh, uh, combat the immense power financially that narco traffickers had. But I think uh, the ideas that he stood for, the, the, the peace in Colombia through negotiations was one of the other uh, motives that uh, got through uh, for assassinating my father. Very, very impressive, the, 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 the whole story. Patricia, would you kindly step in the conversation here and you just, uh, we, we could keep the, the, the sequence. I mean, maybe Pablo can go first and Galan can go second, but Patricia has the word now. Okay, thank you. And um, I not only would step in kindly, but um, as a privilege. Thank you very much. And I would like you um, further more to introduce myself as a friend to these wonderful exemplary citizens um, Colombian natives, but citizens of the world, because what they can tell and what they can teach us by how they have been managing their lives in a very, very exemplary way, as I said. Well, yes. and today, friends, we are having a very special day. That's the world day to celebrate um, Thanksgiving, right? And I think that is very, very special for us to be here all together. I think that every one of us, we have many reasons uh, to give thanks. And even if we don't have a reason, by faith, we should all give thanks. But these two gentlemen, they have so much to teach us in terms of generosity. Mm. Because only out of a huge amount of generosity, one can repent and one can forgive. And it's all about repentment and forgiveness tonight. Because if we don't repent and if we don't forgive, we won't be able to move forward. We won't be able to have a good law, a law that really thinks of human beings. And we much less will be able to have a good regulamentation of any law that we might have in place. So yes, we have to think about others and going beyond ourselves. Because if a human being has a problem, it's a problem of I. We think of ourselves. And having these two gentlemen here with us today, I bet that we are going to learn and we're going to be well taught that we should think more and better about others mm -hmm. instead of just thinking about ourselves. Well, my two very good friends, I am so happy to be here with you. And I'm sure that you both have to overcome a lot of anger, that you both have to overcome an immense thirst for justice, for self-justice. And you have to overcome so much prejudice and persecution in life so far. But yet you decided to take another way. You didn't stay just the way life could take you, hating each other and hating the world, blaming each other and blaming the world for what had happened to you. But you decided to go beyond. And by going beyond, you decided to forgive each other. Please tell us, is it really the war on drugs, the way to go? Is it really this war on drugs, something that we still have to believe in? Because in my country, there is a war going on, but it's a war based upon ideology. People do not believe in science. In science. People do not believe in scientific data. And I know, Galan, that when you pick up this cause, you base yourself in science and scientific data when they spray, when you are able to prove against the spray in the crops. So please tell me where uh, ideology um, should stop and when science should kick in and when we must change our way of thinking because we don't have the truth. We are not the truth. 
Very good yeah, question. Thank you. Should I answer first of Juan Manuel, please? Please go ahead. Go, go ahead, Pablo. Okay. Thank you, Patricia, for allowing me to have this opportunity to join you and Juan Manuel and Alex and Marcelo and to share this experiences with the world. And uh, well, I think that, you know, from my perspective, uh, the war on drugs, the only thing that is supporting is corruption, destruction, you know, the loss of human values. And it's like, it's the formula we are trying to, uh, to use for the past hundred years without any any results, you know, any positive ones. So if you make the list and you, if you take in account that how many cartel leaders were announced, you know, by the authorities in the whole world that were destroyed or let's say killed or in jail. So it's like we lost count of how many organizations in the world are related with the drug trafficking business. And of course, uh, for the past years, the decades, the, um, the authorities are announcing, you know, that these uh, organizations are being dismantled. But, you know, the drugs continue available for everyone. And I'm not saying that the drugs in the whole world are, are the best choice for sure, but I'm saying that we have to take and to recognize every single drug as an individual. We cannot compare each and every one of them. And in, the t in terms of uh, talking about cannabis and the whole prohibition, I think that the world today has uh, very different um, information about the cannabis. And, and of course, I saw this, you know, prohibition is a business. It's a great business opportunity for the ones who are promoting the prohibition. And this is, uh, and how can I say this? And if you think about it, and if you can compare today's stories with my father's in the past, you will see that the drug traffickers in the world, you know, they are receiving so much uh, possibilities to negotiate with the justice system that they can get out, you know, they can be free in, the, in a couple of years and that will be all. And in the, in the times uh, when, when my father was alive, that didn't happen. And all the drug dealers were trying to uh, keep as far away as possible from the United States because they, they, they were afraid of them. But today they are willing to go because they know that they will receive a very good uh, deals with the justice system. So sadly, the message that prohibition is sending to humanity today is that sadly crime does pay, you know, because it's just a matter of how much money do you have to pay for your sins and you can move forward with your life. So that's a, a very sad message that is being sent away to, to a lot of young people who's, who truly believe that my father's uh, story is a successful story. And I don't believe he's a success case. I, I believe he's exactly the opposite. So I think that the world should give, uh, you know, ourselves as humanity, the possibility to change the formula of prohibition because it's not working at all. We have several examples. You know, I, I remember just to say a couple of numbers when my father was in his golden era in Colombia, you know, compared to today's and how much amount of land are being used in Colombia to grow the coca plants and everything. It's, we have three times more than ever, you know, so it's, uh, it's not working, sadly. So I think we, we should look uh, for some other opportunities. And, and if the government of any country can take control of this very profitable business, of course, uh, the government will have the possibility to invest in education, uh, in awareness of the, how to use properly this. And of course, I, as I said from the beginning, the drugs are not good for sure, but they are even worse when they are in the hands of the criminals. And just by decree, uh, this, the most profitable business in the world are, is in the hands of the criminals because, you know, there's a decree who says that. And uh, so we need to give ourselves the opportunity to change the law. And just to, to um, uh, summarize my conversation is, you know, I wanted to, to say to Juan Manuel that I admire him a lot because his father, uh, died because he was, you know, fighting against this. But now that he is uh, doing his best to bring peace to Colombia, 
changing the law and, and, and trying to find a more positive ways to face this. That's something that, you know, I have to say to Juan Manuel that I, I really admired from him because I, you know, everybody could think that because his father passed away and died because of this war and my father's actions, he, he will be full of hate and against any way of legalization. So I, I'm, I think that his testimony is absolutely important to make the world, you know, uh, aware that it's not about hate, it's not about any personal feelings, it's about trying to seek the best way uh, to face this very human problem of addictions. Juan, Juan Manuel? Okay, no, but let me first say that um, I admire deeply uh, Patricia. Uh, she's a very, very close friend of mine. I feel it like that way. And uh, maybe I have to reveal a conversation we had in her house. And she was trying to tell me something. And I, I felt she was kind of afraid of sharing this with me. And she got courage and she told me about her, her friendship with Sebastian. And immediately I, I said, uh, well, you're doing the, the, the good thing. You're going to the right thing. And, and, and that's why we started to speak about Sebastian, about his struggles with life, because I remember my father saying that the first victims of narco-traffickers are their own families. Their own members of their families are the first victims of our narco-trafficker because not only they have to deal with violence, they have to deal with the stigma of uh, the name they have, which is a very hard thing to be, to be, to, to live with. And, and I think Sebastian has been very courageous of seeking out, uh, taking the initiative of uh, looking for her, his father's victims and trying to share these conversations with them to heal the pain. I think as a victim, we all feel an enormous pain when we lose um, someone so precious to us as our father in such an age as 17 years old when you need uh, your father maybe um, uh, more than any time in your life. Uh, but I remember thinking about pain and thinking about that we have a decision to make. We can take this pain that we feel and uh, put it towards hate. I mean, converting this pain in hate which is a poison, I think, hate. Or you can take this pain and uh, make this pain a driving force in life for changing things, for seeing things in another way. And I took the decision of taking my pain that I feel every day because pain never fades away. I mean, in these 31 years that I, I lost my father, it's not a single day that I don't think about him, that I don't think about how he thinks and see things that are happening right now in the world, in Colombia, in many, many areas. So I think Sebastian also uh, was able to take this pain that he felt in his, in his own heart, in his own life, and maybe took the same decision that I took, to take this pain and put it uh, as a driving force towards change, towards humanity. And that's also why I, I got involved in this cause uh, for reg uh, legalization of all drugs. I don't say it in Spanish because in Spanish legalization means like uh, liberalization, which is not what we are talking about. We are talking about that something that criminals control today as access to substances, quality, security, and price it should be controlled by the, by the state. And, and I think abandoning the war on drugs 
it's a moral obligation. It's a moral cause. And we have as a generation an obligation of not inheriting to the next generation the same war on drugs that we've been dealing with for 50 years since Richard Nixon in the 1970s declared declare the war on drugs, which is a failed war, like every war. Every war is a failure. And, and I think uh, 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 this is a failed war because we only have blood victims, displaced people. Uh, we have crime, violence, and we have corruption for the uh, political system and for the democracy. And I think Sebastian said a very wise thing. Prohibition is a great business for the people who lives on prohibition, not only the criminals, the narco-traffickers, but the members of organization and institutions and establishment of the prohibition with uh, the security contractors, with the uh, people that uh, sells the uh, chemical precursors to, to, to make cocaine, because cocaine doesn't grow from a tree. You grow coca and then you take those leaves and with chemicals, you transform that on cocaine. And so there's a whole industry for a few in the war on drugs and in prohibition. And that's why I said we have a moral obligation to change this policy and to base this policy on evidence, on data, on information, on science, on the historical experience of 50 years, on the communities that have suffered directly the violence of the war on drugs, which one another, which they want another way of, of dealing with this. And I, the last thing I would say is that I don't see drugs as the enemy. We don't have to seek a world free of drugs. Drugs have pre-existed our existence of a human race. And when we disappear from the planet, drugs most probably will live on in, in nature. So what we need to do is deal with a question that is more profound. And it's why human beings, especially in the Western world, in the materialistic world, where people see um, well-being uh, as uh, accumulated um, uh, material things as a power to purchase things. Um, I think well-being is another thing that doesn't have anything to do with being rich. Uh, I, I know very rich people that are very miserable in life, that very incomplete, that are very unsatisfied spiritually and in many, many ways. So I think we have to, to, to deal with why human beings look for drugs to, to evade the reality, to fabricate like artificial paradise. And, and I think that's why we have to change the policy towards um, knowing what happens to human beings that they tend to abuse on substance and have an irresponsible and abusive consumption of drugs and, and change the way we see consumption. I think consumption is not a, a bad thing in itself. I think many people get on with their lives in their families, in their communities, in their uh, um, workplace, and their academic life without having any problems. And, uh, but people that have problems with drugs, problematic consumption or addiction need a public health approach, a human rights approach. I was thinking about the recent death of Maradona, which is an idol, a god for the football world, which is for Brazil also a religion as in Argentina. And yes. to see this sad life in addiction with nobody to help him uh, uh, got away from this trap of addiction is a very sad thing for such a talented uh, football guy, which all in the world admire because of their his talent, his talent. Yeah, well, well remembered. Uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with you, with you both. 
I will call and lots of food for thought. Wow, my, my mind is going 100 kilometers per, per hour here as you guys speak. Marcelo, can you jump so many, in the conversation, please? Of course, so many. First of all, thank you for the opportunity of being here, talking to Patricia, to Sebastian, to Galan. It's a real, real honor. Um, and, and thank you for all the collaboration you guys are giving um, to the subject, which is really, really important. I would like to bring uh, to the conversation now um, a brighter side of everything. So we had all this history back and everything that we learned, all the negative things that we had with the war on drugs. And, um, and, and I see now that we have an opportunity to bring to Latin America a brighter future, um, mainly with cannabis um, that, that, that we're working right now. So so in Brazil, we're living in an excellent moment in terms of developing projects, um, focusing cameras. But in political terms here in Brazil, we're moving really, really slow. Um, in Latin America, we see many countries approving new regulations. Uh, we see Ecuador, we see Argentina, Paraguay, uh, with, with good regulation towards hemp. Uh, but at the same time, we see already people, um, like an example in, in Ecuador, asking many questions on what are they going to do with these new regulations now. So we know we can grow hemp. Um, they said we had many opportunities, but some countries are only um, giving them the opportunity to grow, but they're not teaching them, they're not training them, they're not you know, helping them in, in any way. So. So right now, investors and people that are, you know, small growers are asking many important questions on how to build the supply chain for this new ecosystem. Um, so this is a, a question for, for both of you. So how can Latin America governments come together and support and help these initiatives and opportunities that are being presented um, mainly with cannabis? Pablo? Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a cultural problem that this is how I see it. It's very difficult to, uh, to propose uh, something that is going to truly change, you know, our way to, let's say, to uh, live next to the to the drugs we can find in every in every country, so I think it's uh, there's a lot of contradictions that I see today. You can you can because at the same time we are receiving some kind of you know help from the United States in Colombia to fight the war on drugs, and at the same time they are legalizing marijuana in the United States. So it's like there's we are living just a a very special time. And when you can see that there's a lot of contradictions in the middle, because in the same way, the same country who is promoting pro prohibition in some other countries is the same country that is promoting legalization in his own territory. So this is something very unique. And uh, it happens here in Mexico, where I am now. It's, uh, you know, in the United States, I don't know how many states already legalized, but here it's... Uh, still today is prohibited uh, because it's not totally legalized but um, it's like you can find uh, so difficult uh, stories you know i've been talking with the militaries and you can see that they receive orders you know to they wanted to step to stop some let's say some um, trucks that are loaded with cocaine but you know perhaps they could receive a call from the u.s authorities and say hey let, let those trucks continue so it's like we don't understand what's going on and just to say one one last thing uh, you know the to talk a little bit about the DEA the Drug Enforcement Administration and I think that we should pay a lot of attention to the name you know they are the administrators you know they never promised that they were going to put an end to the business so this is what they are doing and I think we need you know, to propose a change and to invite them to uh, see things differently because the only truly effective weapon against 
you know, the drugs, it's education. And it costs less than the guns they are using and everybody's using. And I, as I told to my father, if you need guns to defend your own ideas, you have to check your ideas. And this is the situation we are living today. You know, I, I see there's a lot of contradictions because nobody knows the rules. They are making some rules in their own territory and proposing the opposite ones in the next ones, to, in, the, in the other's territory. So you, you can understand that there's a great business behind and I cannot uh, stop thinking about the Cali Cartel brothers, the uh, Rodriguez Orejuela brothers. They pay to the United States government like two, um, two billion dollars just to erase their family members from the Clinton list. So imagine how much power, you know, is uh, giving prohibition to the civilians, but at the same time, how much money this represents to the ones who are pursuing them. So. We see, sadly, a lot of stories about corruption that sadly nobody talk about them. But, you know, my father even worked with some DEA members, you know, as, an, as a partner. And I should say this, and this is the, the purpose. And I, I'm not trying to accuse anyone of being responsible of anything. And I cannot say that this institution is totally corrupt, but because that will be unfair, totally unfair. But I should say that the, the natural situation of the how is this business you know the rules of this business of the drug trafficking business you know are so mixed up that nobody truly understands who's in charge and who's who's really in charge of this situation and i think that juan manuel of course he, he will uh, he will have a very international perspective and about you know what's going on with the countries and every leg legislation and everything so I think this is this is what I I can I give uh, as an answer for for now. Oh, excellent, excellent vision and contradiction is the word, and you're exactly right. I totally agree with you. We have to solve that as well. Thank you, Carla. Yes, oh. I, I agree with Sebastian about the, the 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 idea that the United States right now has shown, and, and not right now. I mean, through the whole war on drugs history has shown a double moral standard for uh, combating supposedly uh, drugs and, and, and conducting the war on drugs. I think uh, we have to um, see uh, the, 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 the regulation of cannabis as a change of the narrative, as a change of the conception that many, many people have without any evidence that um, marijuana is only harmful and that uh, that's why it's an illegal drug. I mean, if we see the history of uh, uh, prohibition in the US and, 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 and if you analyze that history, you will find that prohibition has nothing to do with the substances and with the drugs. The drive, driving force behind prohibition is racism and is a repression of minorities from Latinos coming to the US. If you see all the prisons in the United States are full of black people, African-Americans and from Latinos, and that's a private business, the prisons in the United States, because they are privatized. And so the owners of those business, their interest is to keep the prisons full of people. So if you see prisons in Europe that are closing because they don't have enough inmates to keep the prisons open, mainly in Holland, for instance, and in other countries of, the, uh, of Europe, in the United States is a great business to have a prison. And the police, in many, many states have this brutal violence against African-Americans like George Floyd and against uh, Latinos and the pretext to be racist and to uh, have violent uh, repression against those population is that drugs are illegal. And we have these cases also in Colombia with the people that we call mulas, 
which they um, have capsules in their stomachs of cocaine, of heroin, and they go through your uh, airport security uh, trying to, to, to pass these drugs. But that helps police to present a press conference with these mulas with a few grams of cocaine or drugs. And then you see by sea on the Pacific, for example, ships with 20, 30, and 40 tons of cocaine. So there's a lot of uh, hypocrisy and a lot of uh, corruption, as Sebastian said, about this uh, conducting of the war on drugs. And that's why the Economist have published two times in, their, in, in its history, one in the 80s and one more recently, a cover of their magazine uh, asking for a regulation, a re legalization of all drugs. But we have also the problem of Vienna and the United Nations. We have two conventions, one from 1961 and another one from 1971, which uh, have this legal international framework about drugs. So we need to reform these conventions, but we have the opposition of a very prohibitive, uh, prohibitionist countries like Russia, China, and Iran. Those are the three main advocates in the international community of keeping the status quo of the war on drugs and not having a different approach, approach on the uh, drug policy. And uh, well, I hope that the arrival of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the US as president and vice president will uh, mean some evolution, as we saw with Barack Obama, some evolution on the drug policy. When Barack Obama said that marijuana was less harmful than alcohol, I mean, I never dream about hearing a US president pronouncing uh, uh, things like that. So I have a hope, I have a hope on the new US government that will make a change and evolution and a hope towards a more sensitive, more human rights based, more public health based uh, policy on drugs. Same here, my friend, same here. <laughs> Very good. I, I lived many, many years in the United States of my life and uh, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. Patricia, please step on again. Thank you for asking because I couldn't hold myself back here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Try to get uh, yeah, I organized. Just, please, can you call me? Um, well, let me start by making two comments. And my first comment is on uh, Pablo's which I will paraphrase his, his idea. If you need guns to advocate your ideas, you better revise your ideas. And I think that it just come in the right times um, to our nation, to our country. Because right now here, it looks like we, people believe that they need guns. And if they don't have one in hand, they will perform with their hand a uh, gesture that will show how much they believe in the power of a gun which is very, very sad because we have an incredible, incredible um, tool uh, inside of us, which is our brain and our intellectual power of argument and exchange ideas and dialogue, which is exactly what we are doing here. So I love when you said that, uh, my friend Pablo, because it couldn't be more uh, precise to what we are living here. And second, um, to Juan Manuel's idea about the double moral uh, mindset stance. This is exactly that, right? Because while um, in some countries they are legalizing the business uh, of marijuana, they are not tackling the most profound mm -hmm. and deep problem, which, a, which, a, which is associational problem. The incarcerated people who were incarcerated because of marijuana. And my third comment, and it also regards to our talking, 
it's that people, it, it looks to me that ideological people, they drag us to talk about marijuana when we want to talk about cannabis. And trying to make us confused or believing that we are talking about the same matters when we are not. And I, I think, you know, when, if, if somebody invites me to talk about cannabis, we are going to talk about public health, we are going to talk about life, well-being, and the well-being of the family members of the, the sick people who need this as a medicine. Are we going to talk about marijuana? Then we are going to talk about public security and we are going to talk about incarceration. And I think that this distinction needs to be made all the time. Otherwise, we will take our audience to the wrong uh, point of thinking. Well, back to my uh, questions um, to you, um, gentlemen. It, it looks to me that we have uh, pretty much the same idea, that money talks. And money talks very highly when it comes to negotiate or bail out legal consequences for actions. As a matter of fact, the most punitive and prohibitionist countries that we have in the map are the countries that have the larger mass incarcerated populations. And this is not, not, this is not by coincidence. And I think that we also agree here that is a tremendous business when you incarcerate people based upon a law that is absolutely racist and divisionist, we are making people more disenfranchised. We are taking um, fundamental rights away and we are making people more uh, disempowered and stigmatized. And we are creating a great cost for the country, a cost that will only be noticed uh, with time, because there is a cost in lacking people um, to the workforce, and there is a cost because people cost when they are incarcerated, and mostly when they are rotten in the, mm -hmm. inside of the public institutions. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with me that this is ultimately connected with the racist uh, policies that we have in our countries and in countries that neighbor our countries? And that demands a huge, deep, profound, probably generational uh, mindset change. Pablo, please. Okay. Patricia, uh, yes, I, I totally agree. You know, it's, uh, I should confess that for me, you know, having uh, the perspective that prohibition is uh, totally linked with racism for me is, uh, you know, I'm like, wow, I'm surprised, you know, just to hear that theory. And I think that's totally exact and correct. Um, it's like I'm just uh, uh, digesting, you know, that that is uh, totally new for, for me and that perspective. And I truly believe in that. Um, and I believe that is, um, you know, and when we talk about uh, the inmates, perhaps in the United States, and it's uh, they have like uh, workers for them for a very low, low price. It's like a new way to be a slave, and uh, this is how I used to call with you know the highest respect. But I think that I call the the drug traffickers today like the modern slaves because they think they are working for free for themselves and they are they are being so rich and etc. But they don't know that they are working for someone else who's going to take all the assets and the money and the power out of them and and will use that for other purposes. So they don't know because they think that they are just uh, living la vida, but uh, someone else is behind them and is going to take all of all of the assets for them. And this is exactly what's happening with the drug traffickers today. So having that perspective of you know, prohibition and racism is, uh, is something that we should keep for ourselves to think about it and, and to propose uh, a change of perspective, a change of, you know, we have to overcome this way of thinking and, and give ourselves a second chance to design uh, a new politics, uh, new policies on drugs, because the ones that we have today are not working and are, you know, damaging 
more the society than helping it. Yeah, when you when you mention the slaves, uh, it reminds me of the Brazilian favelas, right? That you, you guys know, uh, where kids at the age of 12, 13 are already involved in the in the drug system, and uh, the expectation of life is maybe 20, 25, and, and that's about it. So it's uh, it's slavery is a is a word that definitely applies, I believe. Yeah, you mentioned that. Um, Gala, uh, can you take it? Yes, I, I will say about Patricia's question that there's nothing more racist than the war on drugs that I can think about today. And I think if Martin Luther King was alive, if all those champions from the uh, civil rights in the US in the 60s were alive, they will stand up today against the war on drugs because it's a new frontier on uh, combating uh, structural racism, as they call it today in the United States. And, and I think uh, that's a, 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 a thing that it's deeply dividing the United States right now between what uh, Trump represents with 75 million votes and then what the other half of the United States that voted for Biden with 77 million votes. It's a deeply divided country and I think war on drugs contributes to that division. And I think Brazil is a country uh, with a huge Af African-American population, Brazilian, African-Brazilian population. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in uh, Salvador de Bahia, uh, there it's were a, uh, coming in more slaves than the whole the United States combined. So I think that issue in Brazil, it's a, 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 a tremendous issue for the future of the Brazilian society as a society united, as a society that recognizes itself as Brazilian, as sharing the same values, the same principles, the same idea of their nation. And, and I'm sorry I'm talking about Brazil, but that's oh, my no. point of view about it, how it, I see you. And, and 55, 55% 50, or 54% of the population is, is African descent 56. in Brazil. It's incredible. 56. And, and I think what Patricia has been doing with the women inmates, uh, helping them shape, reshape their lives, uh, reshape uh, with a project of entrepreneurial, social entrepreneurial uh, project that that has changed dramatically the lives of women that they don't have, didn't have any hope at all. And, and we didn't have this, I don't know how they call it in English, resocialization principle of, of the, the, the sentence. When you are sentenced to prison, you, you have to, 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 to pass a process of resocialization, as we call it in Colombia. And, and I think the resocialization aspect of the prisons it's very weak in our countries. I mean, people, when, get, when they get into prison, they go out as criminals, <laughs> most of them. Yeah. So, so I think to build them a, a, a project that gives them hope when they go out for them and for their families and the, for their communities is a thing that, that we have to, to celebrate. Uh, and and I, I, I admire that work that that Patricia has been doing with those women. Patricia, would you, would you, <laughs> you just mentioned a couple Thank of times. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And um, well, I, I just think, and I, I think that we all agree uh, tonight that we can only just talk. We have to walk the talk. And yeah. by pointing the problem, that does not take, a, take us out of the equation bring us to the equation. If we point out the problem, make yourself responsible to come out with some sort of, if not the entire solution for the problem, but at least a way and make yourself responsible, make yourself accountable. And responsibility is something that it seems to me to be out of fashion nowadays. We like to uh, blame others 
but we don't like to make ourselves responsible for whatever good and bad happens in our countries and whatever good and bad happens in our, in our society, in our community. So if I point out that we live in a racist um, society and I, I had an upbringing that was very racist myself, I have to step in and bring some sort of awareness to myself, to my family and to, to the people that I live with and make some sort of, of change. But the change starts within ourselves. And that's what uh, I believe that Gala is referring to because he's been watching and he's been you know, supporting what we are doing. And um, as much as Sebastian also, and, and, and bringing others together. We, as I said, we got to change our mindsets. And first of all, we need to understand how uh, punitivists and how prohibitionists we were and we are because we belong to this. It's not something that happens outside of us. And by making this, you know, self-criticism, you know, thinking pro process, uh, we can be changed and we can change. Oh, fantastic. I, well, uh, it's my role and I hate doing this, especially on an occasion like this, but um, it's about time that we wrap it up. So, uh, Patricia, since you're at it, would you uh, just, is it okay to leave your final comments, remarks, and, and leave a message before we, and we'll circle around and uh, we'll wrap it up in the next few minutes. Well, I, I, I think I just did some of it, but okay. I, I would really call the attention of our audience to be um, very, very aware, very wise, very great to um, take a stand on a matter that we know very little. So be careful when you take a position, when you take a stand, we know very little. Um, be aware of what's been talking. If we are talking about cannabis, if we are talking about marijuana, those are two very different things. Um, let's really focus on public health. Let's focus on reconciliation. Let's focus on making peace out of a matter that only has brought violence, death, and division into our societies. Uh, our two very honorable guests here are really living proof of how life can take um, sad, difficult um, paths, but also um, history must not determine our paths, our future. We can change history if we are faithful, if we believe in second chance, and if we believe that human beings um, have an opportunity and have a talent, have a gift that no other, um, you know, living creature has, which is our intellectual power and our power for compassion. Fantastic, Patricia. Marcelo, buddy, uh, your final words and comments, please. Yeah, so really really grateful and and really really nice some coincidence like patricia said today is thanksgiving so an opportunity to have this this talk on this special day with these two wonderful gentlemen and and this is our 10th edition of the cannabis thinking talks and and our first one was with steve d'angelo where we talked a lot about social and about how how not fair it is for some people um, getting, uh, you know, rich with, with, with cannabis in, in the United States and how so many people are still imprisoned and so many people are suffering prejudice and, and racism is going on. So it, it, it's, it's really, it's an honor to, to have the 10th, the last one. So the first one of the year was we, we approached social and then the last one we're approaching forgiveness and we're approaching... Um, uh, this, this, the social event and us is our last cannabis thinking of the year. So I'd like to thank everybody for this opportunity. And, and this is going to be a really special day in my life. And, and, and I hope the audience um, enjoys everything that was, that was talked here today. Thank you very perfect. much. Perfect. Perfect. Marcelo. Perfect. Just to keep the order. Um, Pablo, please. 
your your final words. Okay, thank you, Alex. For this well, time, okay? a, for this time, yes, because we'll make excuse for you to come to Rio. You're safe because uh, of the coronavirus, okay? But yeah, we'll make excuses for that to happen. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Count on well, me. I, I, it thank you, Patrice. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, it was a, a great opportunity to. It, perhaps this is the first time that I have the chance to talk with Juan Manuel and with all of you about uh, legalization, regularized drugs and cannabis and everything that happened. So for me, it's, it's, it's such an important moment uh, as a, just as, a, as an individual, as a human being, uh, for having uh, Patricia's comments and Juan Manuel's thoughts about the war on drugs and how he sees the problem and what kind of solutions uh, is he proposing. So for me, it's so important. And, 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 and I can say that I feel hope that in the next years, the world will, will give himself the opportunity to declare peace on drugs and move forward with education, with uh, cultural events, you know, and, and trying to find Uh, scientific ways to deal with the problems that we have with the old with the drugs in the world and um, I'm just I feel joy and happiness to have this opportunity to share my thoughts and and just my knowledge I have no interest at all in in the in the drug trafficking business I, I you know uh, sadly my life has been affected a lot uh, by this way of seeing things in the world. But I truly believe that um, the people is uh, not believing everything that is being told about the, the war on drugs and how this should be handled. So I truly believe that events like this one will give the world and Brazil the opportunity to start thinking differently for the future and for the best of our society. So I thank you very much for having um, and giving me the opportunity to share my, my experiences with you. And, and I encourage you to keep doing it. Thank you. We will, we will and then we will all keep on going, no doubt about it. Juan Manuel Galan, uh, your final remarks and of course the invites to Brazil anytime just let us know and uh we'd be delighted to have you down here uh very soon as as soon as possible thank you very much alex no i will say that um i feel that uh, sebastian and i we share uh, something that it's uh, crucial to this debate and we share the condition that we are both victims of the war on drugs. Uh, we, we, for in many different ways. And, but I will say that uh, for the case of the cannabis, I think we, we, we don't have to, um, we cannot have, we cannot lose sight about the ethical sense that this process that we are in for a regular, regularization and legalization of drugs should uh, bear in mind, especially cannabis. We have to think about the patients, about our main objective, the access to a substance that it's uh, safe, that it's a uh, very high standard of quality and that helps alleviate pain and um, improve the way of life that many patients that suffer terrible diseases are right now uh, dealing with and their families. And we have also to think about the small growers, the communities that have suffered the war on drugs, the violence, that are not criminals, that have not used violence against each other, but they have growth out of necessity, these illegal crops. We have to build a bridge for them to pass from illegality to legality. And uh, that's a, uh, and we have also uh, an ethical 
um, obligation and is to improve research, innovation, science. Uh, that's crucial to this industry uh, because we have to build up um, scientific evidence, not only anecdotal evidence or um, ancestral evidence, which is a very rich uh, part of this evidence, but anecdotal evidence about uh, a, a cousin or an aunt or a grandmother that suffer something and they use cannabis and it, this was uh, okay for them to alleviate their pain. We need doctors involved. We need researchers, laboratories to build up this evidence, medical evidence about cannabis so doctors can be uh, trustful or of prescribing cannabis uh, for their patients. And that's a crucial thing. And, and finally, I will say that um, in this world that we're living on, I think politically, we need to recover uh, the ethical sense of uh, doing politics. And I think the ethical sense right now of doing politics, it's the ethic of care, care of human dignity and care of the uh, planet, care of our environment. And uh, abandoning the war on drugs will help enhance this moral value and this ethical sense of the ethics of care about human dignity and the environment. And I think we have a responsibility, as Patricia was saying, and that's the responsibility of having enough will to do things, the right thing. Uh, with will in life, we are able, you are able to accomplish almost anything with will. And we need political will here to evolve towards a new policy on drugs. Fantastic. Fantastic, gentlemen. So, I mean, from my side, I could, again, uh, thank you guys over and over. But to let's say remind, that... Let's remind people that we're going to have these, these gentlemen. Oh, yeah, yeah. The cannabis, in the, in the cannabis thinking 2.0. Uh, exactly. December first, with you know, with excellent, excellent content. So we'll have them again as our special yes. guests. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcelo, for reminding me. I, I always forget about something, but there's an <laughs> upcoming event called Cannabis Thinking. It's a second edition. It's fully online, and these two guys uh, uh, will be there uh, in with uh, their own talks, but. I just want to set point out for the uh, how comfortable every time I've been to Colombia a couple of times, and I mean it's it we feel so close to you guys in terms of culture, uh, Brazil and Colombia, and I, I truly believe that Latin America has a great opportunity through cannabis and through this whole thinking about you know uh, like uh, Galan said you know with through innovation through startups. Um, you know, connection between doctors from different countries. We've been talking to doctors from all over Latin America. And um, so let's enhance that, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, take this opportunity because we're still very young, all of us, and uh, in a position to, let me, to make, let make me, a difference. Let me tell you something, Alex. Sure. Uh, we had a Portuguese uh, coach for the national football team and we have 3-1 with Uruguay, we lost, and we lost 6-1 yeah. with Ecuador. That's the proof that we don't need a, a Portuguese uh, and, uh, trainer, but we need a Brazilian coach for the Colombian uh, football selection, no? Wow. Uh, <laughs> you can debate that. <laughs> the generation is not the best, but anyway. <laughs> But football and, and uh, the way we, 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 we look at life and enjoy life in general, I mean, Colombia and Brazil are certainly very close. So with this, uh, I would like to close the 10th edition of the Cannabis Thinking Talks. Again, it will be uh, up and running in, in our channel at, in YouTube with um, uh, understanding uh, – I always forget subtitles, about the, words. the subtitles. Subtitles in Portuguese and in Spanish. Great. This is, was a great talk. Thank you all. God bless you all.
See you next Thank time. Thank you.